Music, you know, it's the, it's the lifeblood. It's like the lifeblood of the people. Like oil, oil is to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> One in their wildest dreams would ever have thought that a small island like Jamaica has now been able to create a music that is part of the mainstream. <laughs> we need it, we must have it. Oh, you get up, stand up. Oh, you bring a man access to your villa. Press for sun, a witness, all of your clean on your pillar. You better watch your back before she turn into a killer. The, the music is something like a gravity, like a magnet. <laughs> it insists to, 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 to hold on to you. I've been touched by an angel. Forward! March! <laughs> On August 5, 1962, Princess Margaret finally pulled down the Union Jack after more than 300 years of British rule in Jamaica. The soundtrack to this newfound freedom was the first truly Jamaican music, the newly invented ska. Because the time has come and we can have some fun, so take a run. You know, it was just a simple song and the people them jumped to it and, you know, going around. And they, whoa, 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 we're independent and, they, you know, flash them hands and you know, it was great. That was something to see and never can come back in Dominica. Independence came at that time when Ska was in its peak. Yes. And so it was just jubilation all around. You understand? You know, with the, with, with the acceptance that we were now a free country and Ska in its peak. And, and everyone just went, went crazy for it. You couldn't go to a party before 62 to play Ska. After that night, you, you had to play Ska for the party to be successful. It was unbelievable. Everyone gravitated to it. They saw something new, and I noticed something too. They had pride. They, when they looked at it, they said, this is ours. It would have been nice to say, well, independence caused people to want their own music, but the music preceded independence. But it was a wonderful coincidence, because independence gave it further drive. The music came first. The story of modern Jamaican music starts in the early 1950s in the poorer areas of downtown Kingston with the emergence of a uniquely Jamaican phenomenon, still at the heart of the music 50 years later, the sound system. The sound system is essentially a street discotheque with speakers big enough to raise a family in. It's where poor Jamaicans have been coming to dance till they drop, ever since they stopped listening to jazz bands in the now ruined clubs all over the island. You had sound system before recording. You have the, first it started, the Jamaica music started with orchestra dance. But when the sound system came in, they replaced the musician because People used to hire these bands to play, but the musician used to stop and eat a lot of corrigo, so it, it burned up a lot of time and thing, you know. The band would go intermission, and intermission forever. So the people got to get fed up with this no dance, with another dance. So in the intermission, they made a mistake. They agreed that the first sound system should play in the intermission. That was the end of them. I never turned back. 
It was all about rhythm and blues. As the 1950s rolled on, the music of Fats Domino, Ray Charles and Louis Jordan was streaming into the island from Southern American radio stations just over 90 miles away. And with the sound systems blasting it out most nights of the week, downtown Kingston went dance crazy. And like any craze, it was rich with opportunity. People used to make money from it. You sell your own beer and you sell your own curry goat and rice. And you got the sounding system from 8 o'clock till like 6 in the morning and they eating and dancing in the street. You get like two, three thousand people and you make a bump. Sound systems became the biggest local industry in downtown Kingston and competition was fierce. To pull in the punters, you had to have the best music blasting out of your system. The race was on for the hottest American tunes. It's a sensation. You know, American people, they need cheap labor, so they bring me to cut them cane and things. But why are you there cutting cane? If you buy a rhythm and blues, six times more money you get because you're going to sell it back to sound system people. So everybody anxious to go to the farmer, but not for cut cane. They want to go buy some record. <laughs> you know? Out of this fierce competition, two giants emerged, Clement Cox and Dodd and Arthur Duke Reed. Combining their liquor businesses with their sound system dancers, they were effectively the barons of downtown Kingston and would continue to control the Jamaican music business for the next 15 years. They could run the country those days because people, had, where, anywhere they sound string up, you have the crowd of people there before. They used to play in, in competition. It come in now like um, Joe Fraser and Holly. Duke Reed is the man who go on this dance and he go to the gate and he get everybody out of the gate money for coming on and dance, you know? And the people they believe all the cocks and dance and come on to Duke Reed. Sometimes they just take the money and go to the cocks and dance just to see him, you know what I mean? So it's like that. So all of them used to be at war, you know? Oh, the sound system thing, man. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a traditional thing. You, you, you can't stop it. It has like to come from way back, you know? Come on. Yes, suddenly rum is served to sophisticates because suddenly Jamaican rum has regained its place among the great drinks of the world. Duke Reed had a rum there where they don't sell in the stores. If you think rum is strong, you ask about rude to your parents. When you throw water, you know what happened? Yes. You throw chase in it. What do you Smoke. Little smoke, vapors thing. Right? And that is what the bread of my drink, like they have cocaine now, that was for them cocaine. So after you could give them two drink a root to your parents and send them go across and dance. The dance done. People are jump fence to get out the fast fast. <laughs> You Creed, he had a program on the radio, I think 4.30 on a Saturday afternoon called Treasure Isle Time. They would advertise the liquor business and then he would, on those programs, they would play newly made Jamaican records. They decided to drink some more, but when I look at the clock, it was quarter to four. To promote their sound systems, Reed and his competitors had turned to record producing by the end of the 50s, but not as we know it today. They had no intention of selling records to anyone else. They brought jazz musicians down from the tourist hotels to play Jamaican versions of American R&B, and then they just made one copy of each record to play on their sound system and achieve the much prized exclusive. We start imitating the rhythm and blues songs like say, Smiley Lewis or Professor Longyear or Louis Jordan and you know those kind of beat we tried to imitate it it didn't turn out that way so we decided to keep this as our own type that's how that can come in Styling like those was really rhythm and blues. What we did to this rhythm and blues is like you'll be doing. 
one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But the, the, the scanner we change it to one, two, three. And then it's more two, four, two, four, instead of one. It is Jamaica's first musical revolution. And we call it Skia. And then Skia was a dirty word. But what it was, it was um, terribly influenced by Jamaican activities of the people, you know. Culture of Jamaica was pushed into it. And when the people took it on that fast, right, they just grabbed to it because it was them. This is the way of life of the lower class people. They haven't got anything else. What else do we have? I mean, the middle class or the upper class can uh, buy a ticket and go to Miami or somewhere like that. That's all you have. You don't know anything else. You would not find the creative force that comes out of the inner city in the residential areas in Jamaica because they're more settled into a pattern, into a tradition. Uh, there's a social divide and a cultural divide. We live in two countries. When Ska was popular downtown, it had no popularity uptown. In 1960, much of uptown Jamaica still preferred American music, and many of the jazz musicians who had invented Ska were making a living playing the tourist resorts of the North Coast. Of a serious type of class prejudice in those days, let's call it that way. <laughs> you know, and it would have hurt my career in a certain sense. You couldn't go up, uptown and play ska music, so it was really like a, an outlaw type of music, you know. In 1960, Prince Buster started his own sound system. To steal a march on his rivals, he approached the ultimate outcasts of Jamaican society, the Rastafarians, who since the 30s had looked to Africa rather than Europe as a model. He persuaded Count Ozzy and his master drummers down from the Warwicker Hills into a recording studio. At in those days, if you say he's a Rasta, all the avenues is black for you now. And when I make Carolina, that the Rasta would Rasta speak. Because now, them, it was not a music world, them could play upon sound system. And if you play upon sound system around the island, everybody go and hear you. In the early years in Jamaica, the Rasta foreign community went under so much pressure, you know. At one stage, I'm harder. I think there was a decree in Jamaica. Mm, to kill um, the Rasta man. To kill the Rasta man and question him Chim after, man. you know. Countazi. Countazi. Countazi, you know. You know, 90% of all the grassroots music that's really played are created by the Rasta people, you know. Rasta and Jamaican music have been inseparable ever since. Even at the independence celebrations, Count Ozzy and his troupe were part of the pageant laid on for Princess Margaret, whose reaction remains unrecorded. We brought with us most of the music of Africa, the rhythm the kumina as a form of dancing, the Nyabingi drumming by our Rastafarians. To that has been fused some of the jazz influences emanating from our sisters and brothers in New Orleans. Culture has been a very strong element in all our art forms, but particularly in our forms of musical expression. Lord of Lords, in this land, no 
more about the talk than me of you. Cause I'm king from the beginning. I was made king. Lion said, I am king and I reign. What it developed from was uh, Calypso. Lion said, I am king and I reign. The Calypso singers sing about, they sang about, well, lots of them used to sing about sex, but they also sing about um, topical things like that, so it's coming out of that. When you want to know what's going on, I mean, you know, you listen to the songs. It is a kind of folk music. Our country contested at the Lyceum the title Miss World. They numbered 40. I'm calling you myself. The emerging nation was full of optimism and with prosperity increasing, everybody wanted to own the ska records that up until now they only had heard on the sound systems. People started buying Jamaican records. Jamaican records was accepted as the record um, to buy because you're hearing yourself, you're hearing things to do with you. Eager to capitalize on this new market, the sound system operators reinvented themselves as record companies. Prince Buster's Voice of the People, Duke Reed's Treasure Isle, and initially the top label Coxon, run by the taciturn Clement Dodd. He was the first to realize that you could make a living beyond the sound system. With his profits, he set up the legendary Studio One, the first recording studio in Jamaica to be owned by a black man. Studio One was um, a permanent place that um, people recorded almost every day. We were always free to go there and record whenever we feel like. And these are the kind of facilities that you got that made it a special place, you know? Because it's like home, musically. Studio One is like Jamaica's Motown. That's where all the great artists, you know, we say they graduate at this place, Studio One. This was like a nine to five job. We went there early morning and we would record all day. And I went in there at seven. I used to live at Mr. Dad's house with his children. Yeah. So every morning, I'd go to the studio with him and open the studio. He would pick up a, 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 an assistant, his name is Bim Bim. Yeah, Bim Bim. Pick up yeah, Bim Bim yeah, first. Yeah. We'll go to the studio, we'll open the studio and make his rounds. Every day we'll close the studio every night, drop Bim Bim home. It's like, like heaven. Just like in the old days of the sound system, Coxon constantly needed new sounds to stay ahead. Every Sunday morning, young hopefuls gathered in his yard, hawking their songs and looking for a shot at the big time. You listen to all them guys go up and sing, you know, and every time, but, you know, we would sing around, around the side, you know, and they would say, you're so good, you know? and every time they would say, you're a turn, man. So no, make them go on, make them go on. When I, I, I saw Coxon himself did an audition, right, or some auditions too, before I started that, and he would tell artists that he figured weren't ready, I didn't want them back. I said, okay, um, come back seven years time, you know? <laughs> it was six o'clock in the evening, I was the last person to go up. You know, the place was still packed. Up. And you know, my first song, you got to be sure of a woman's love. Everybody crowd around, man. Everybody say, you know, vice, you know. <laughs> Everyone crowd around, you know, and Mr. Dad say, nice. And then, the Tuesday, I went on to my first two songs. Another group of youngsters signed by Coxon were the Whalers, Bunny Whaler, Bob Marley, and Peter Tosh. In 1964, within a year of Studio One's opening, they sold an astonishing 70,000 copies of Simmer Down. Trenchtown was vibrant with a lot of activities. The place was like a, what do you call it, like a Piccadilly. 
like 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 Hollywood music has been the center of attraction. Everybody was singing like a family. So if the soulists have a recording, you'd have Bob, Peter Bonney, Delroy, you know, guys from the Paragons, everybody would come to give background support. If the Whalers have a session sometime, you would have the Ask Us Girls come work with us tonight. We have two tunes doing this and look at all the harmony. So that was like fun. We weren't being paid because Coxon, we, we didn't get money at that time. Sometimes we get money to buy us a patty or cocoa bread and if we're going on Fridays we would get a pound or 30 shilling or something like that. But we didn't have a problem. <laughs> It was a very productive period in Jamaica's musical history. Hit after hit, you know, every month there would be a new hit for different singers. And it, it, it was as if all the singers and the, the talent in popular music had been kept locked up in a cupboard. But from the first hit was made, it is as if the cupboard doors opened and all this talent just poured out. Studio One's music was made downtown for downtown people. The musicianship necessary wasn't that easy to achieve if you were poor in Kingston. But luckily there was also a downtown academy. If Studio One was Motown, the Alpha Boys School was the Juilliard School of Music. school is a school that caters to the unfortunate. It teaches them trades that they can earn a living after they leave here and some go abroad. I think you met Rico Rodriguez, he's a trombonist. My mother couldn't angle me no more and that's the way I end up in Alpha. Maybe she feel I'm more protected up there. The young man, him grow very quick, him, him, you know what I mean? Him, him become very wise, very quickly. You understand? Yeah. Cause life, tough life, you know. Life hard. Okay. And out of, out of poverty, bring it wisdom, you understand? why I'm here was because my parents abandoned me, but I thank God for that in some reason. Ali said, you must honor thy mother and father, but I still love her, and in the future, I'd like to find her. So, at Alpha, Alpha is good. I learn music, and I also learn education. Many of Jamaica's greatest musicians have been from Alpha. Coxon in particular was quick to appreciate the value of the kind of discipline and ability you might expect from that institution. The backbone of his house band were largely alpha old boys, and they became the first superstars of Skia, the Scatterlites. Oh yes, the Scatterlites. That was Johnny Moore. He is touring France now and Lester Sterling, he's in America. Tommy McCook was very good at that. He was a saxophonist. You had Dom Drummonds. He was very quiet. He loved his instrument. 
And when he was still in school, he was about the best trombonist in Jamaica. Cadillacs were a great set of people. At the time, they were the masters. They were learned musicians. They were not just people who played music by, you know, by the breath. They were doing it by the paper. And we the whalers were really enthused to be to have been working with the Scatterlights. There came on the scene this talented aggregation, the most formidable array of talent which Jamaica has ever seen in a single band and dare I say is ever likely to see in the future. They were it. Anywhere they played, for, for dances, the place would be Ram Jam. We play at a place one night and say the place loaded with people and a woman come and dance to the skirt. And I'm watching that woman dance and we see she kick back. And when we finish playing go out, I hear the woman die, the deck around she scars it till she dropped the man dead. <laughs> <coughs> Serious thing, man. What's the scar killer? Yeah man. Yeah man. The scar scatter light carry a heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah man. Two years after independence, with the Scatterlights at their peak, was the golden age of Jamaican ska. But the foundations of the band were shaky. They became frustrated with the insularity of the Jamaican music scene, and more significantly, Don Drummond, the band's greatest genius, was slowly losing his mind. Drummond's virtuoso trombone playing lay at the heart of the Scatterlights' greatest moments. A lot of his compositions were minor chord tunes. Smooth, more melodic kind of flow, while Rico would be more brassy and more like orchestrated, like, you know, to the beat. Don slides with it. Drummond took Skir to new heights of virtuosity. He had a unique style with a disturbing emotional undertow that reeked of Africa and mirrored the demons in his head. He got in friendship with this lady and um, he didn't like her dancing and so that brought a sort of a bone of contention between them. Jealousy and the lack of material and career advancement built up disastrously in the mind of the introspective Drummond. And on New Year's Eve 1964, he killed his girlfriend Margarita. I used to say to myself, I wonder if he's really guilty of doing, doing, this, doing that act. But they, they, they found him guilty and then they placed him in the, the madhouse, Bellevue that is. And after a while, he had some altercation with somebody there, or with people there, and or some fuss, and he died. I was sorry to hear, because he was such a great musician, very, very great, regardless of, of how mad he was. Without Don Drummond, the Scatterlights were never quite the same again. And anyway, musicians couldn't make that much money in Jamaica. To make a living, many of the most talented musicians joined the thousands of other Jamaicans on the boat to England. You know, so I'm not changed from Jamaica far. Me, me, uh, me, me I play music a long time and I really play with my band or not, you know. So, coming to England, try out my luck. Without any breath, 
To the newly arrived Jamaican, London nightlife was a strange and often unnerving experience. When you go there, you know what they was playing. Bottoms up and the choo-choo-choo and all these kind of things. Knees up. Are you coming from Jamaica where you used to? So we couldn't take it. And the jazz club, well, it's never on. Every club you go in London is, sorry, you got to be a member. Won't let you. Once you're black, you can't get in. You know what I mean? You couldn't get into Ronnie Scott. You couldn't get into Lions Corner House, the big jazz club. So then I said to Vinny, look, you build a sound, we will support you and get the record like Jamaica from America. And this is how it starts. My parents were only here five or six, seven years until 1965. Yeah. So it was almost like a letter from home, hearing rhythms, rhythm tracks from Jamaica. Shabins and blues Shabin, dances yeah, weren't no. just exclusively for, no. for, for people. people. Yeah, it started you know. off exclusive. It yeah. started off. But they then were in certain areas. Yeah. As well. I mean, yeah. Yeah. you worked. Um, you worked on the yeah. buses, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, you were the conductor and the driver's wife. And then you, you you know you can't help but be together all day long, right? And you talk about what you do for recreation, and, this, and then you say to the to the driver, look. We're having a party over so and so and so and so. And he comes around and thinks, oh, that's nice, isn't it? And he tells another few of his mates of it. Little Miss Muffet, she sat on a tuffet, eating her curse and whey. Came a big spider, sat down beside her. He frightened Miss Muffet away. Watch her. Whoa. Whoa. We used to go down to number nine Blenheim Crescent, where was a little cafe uh, with a little jukebox, and uh, you'd get some food. And I always remember Car oh, Carolina was on the jukebox, and in back there was a, a kitchen with a chef, and you can get meat and rice. That must have been 1961. <laughs> Sister Ignatius from Alpha gave me the money to come to England. I was like our number one boy, like best boy then, you know what I mean? At, and she used to look after me in school very good. He took the trumpet and he was very helpful because I used to send him to my brother's store and so on. He used to do shopping. Funny. It was this great cultural mix and at the same time Buster came over from Jamaica and we had access to uh, West Indian records. Greatly yeah. opened our ears because the British mark, I mean British record releases was pretty limited at that time, you know, we were hearing cover versions and you had to hear the original. Yeah, we had, we had access to the real thing. You felt like you were at the start of something. Yes. By 1962, the scene was big enough to move from West London to the West End. Soon, Count Suckle's The Roaring Twenties in Carnaby Street became one of the hippest venues in town. It was a late night dive. Maltese, prostitutes, striptease girls, the old of the West End. Everybody, white, musician, because they come down. The Rolling Stone, they were scruffy. All of the stones. Because they used to play round the corner at a club called The Scene in Wilmill Street, downstairs. A girl named Sandra used to run it. People was like coming at five in the morning, six. And that's when I met Christine Keeler, Mandy Wright Davis, and Profuma. I mean, I didn't know he was a minister at the time, but he just come down with the girls. Well, we'd, we used to say he was a sugar daddy. 
I remember the run 20s, maybe sometimes it's 20 of us, you know, 20, 15, you know. And, and going home was a problem to far. We couldn't get no taxi to go home, sometimes we have to walk, you know. Sometimes along the way you get thirsty, you know. So you drink all the milk and the orange juice inside, you know. Yeah. So you have a lot of fun, you know. Yeah, you're so tired coming from the dance, you know, the snow, you know. So it was an experience in the, in the 60s when I just come here. You know. You know, I wonder when I come the first time in England, I remember. First time I leave Jamaica, right? When I come over London, I look through the plane. And I wonder if people live here. You know, your story books. I read so much about three little pigs and the wolf. And you see, the trouble is, they draw the house in the book. Then when I come in, you know, all the house stuff look like you hear that house? <laughs> <laughs> we hide, we hide in the air, and you look down. It's pure that kind of house. I say, oh yes. Yeah. And I look for the wolf, no guy. <laughs> <laughs> in Britain was distributed on the Blue Beat label, which was how it became known. Blue Beat was the music of choice for the mods, the scooter riding youths who flocked to the concerts and made Britain a hugely important market for the music. They saw me as a rebel and identified themselves as such. So there was some compatibility there. I think so because you, you should see them, but I make me sure. It's just coming at me and them as one. And then protect her right through the tour. By 1964, Jamaican record entrepreneur Chris Blackwell was convinced he could get a UK hit with a Skia record. He had the right singer in Millie Small, so he brought over Ernest Ranglin to London to provide the spark. It was more on the blue spot. You was listening to a couple of blue beat tunes and, and stuff like that, you know. And then um, the biggest breakthrough was when, you know, Millie Smalls came out with My Boy Lollipop, and I think that changed everybody. We started to get hits in England because that's where it became an international music, especially with my boy Lollipop by Millie Small. That put us on the map. So the uptown people started to take notes to make it a national sound rather than downtown sound. Yes, this is ska, original and indigenous. These instruments are playing a monotonic grassroots rhythm. As Uptown Jamaica and the rest of the world joyously accepted Skia, downtown the music and the mood were changing. The Skia was upbeat. It expressed how the, the spirit of the people was. And then after, people start to observe and say, oh, this independence, I'm not really independent. What's going on? The music slowed down. Let's rock it steady and see what's going on. Slow down. Poverty breeds crime. You wake up in the morning and you don't know where next meal is coming from. You know, all kind of things start going through your mind. For if he's rough, he's against the world. By 1966, downtown Kingston was a lawless place. This was the era of the so-called rude boys, the ruthless gangsters who terrorized the nation. 
the food boy. Guys are coming at dance, man. No cure you dressed in a three piece suit. Them guys are change things. Them just come in our shorts and no shirt and hard turn up back way. And the girls flock them and them just do so. That's how the rat said the name did come in, you know. And the DJ have to play when he reach, he say, cry tough with Alton Ellis and anything you can do, I can do it better. I am the toughest and I'm throw a box of beer in the air and it mash. This guy come to me and said, his name Busby, he was a rude boy. When I say rude, I mean rude, because he would travel with gun and he travel with knife and he would take any buckle and cut you, anything. Come to me one day and say, boy, I hear everybody has seen rude, boy, cry tough and oh seven and them guys, I want you to make one of me. You just want to boost me and I want it by Friday. And so I said, okay, I will make you a song, sir. Strong like lion. I am rude is no fear. Boss be listen. I say play it back. I say when we reach strong like lion, we are and just take out two of the beer and throw it against the wall and crash it and say, I am. Everybody get in panic now, you know, because they're afraid of him, because they know him. What he can do for him, what he won't do. The whole night is the one song, it's coming like the dance stop. Rude is no fear. I don't know if he didn't like the song, what he would do. <laughs> but anyhow, he did love him. Boys, rudies don't fear. Rougher than rough. Tougher than tough. But he didn't love it for long. He didn't love the song for long because he loses life the following day. And we just cut out the rude boy songs, eh, man. So, well, if we go and cause eruption, just leave it there. All I need from you is a good conversation. As things hotted up downtown, people sang, and most of them escaped into old fashioned boy meets girl love songs. This was Rock Steady, Jamaica's first pop music the era of singers who replaced the largely instrumental ska and for many it was the most glorious phase in Jamaican music. Never felt this way before I know there is some way today It all came from the American um, R&B music you know because we're always um, being influenced by the impressions all them soul R&B groups we would listen to a Dionne Warwick song and try to sing it exactly as Dionne did it. If you are a group, you would try to study the Supremes, Martha Reeves and the Vandellas. If there was a group who come, comes from abroad to our shores, we would want to go and see them because they have something to teach us. It's a cultural thing for Jamaicans to sing. In the ghetto, you'll find more singers than anywhere else too, because you know it's a thing that you know it's, it's, a, it's a thing we used to. It's what we could use to pass the time away. It's, it's, it's a thing you use to soothe your your spirit, your soul. You know. Young compare well, have been touched by an angel. This heaven and earth could be no hell. I've been touched by an angel. She's on a progressive chart, tell me so work for where she want With no confidence and never yet says she can't Tend the love you know she have Heal any broken heart from she come in on my life Me no stop advance, rearrange my lonely life and turn it right from start No I'm happy with this woman and we will never part eh? Me know she clever and she smart I've been touched by an angel Most of us, we only wanted to hear our voices on the record To see people, to, to hear it on the radio is a dream come true. To see people dancing and singing to your record for the first time is another matter completely. La, 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 la. There was no thought of any money or anything else more than honesty, sincerity, and purity. And that is what I think that music is full of. That, you know, that is why it's lasting so long. songs 
lived. You'll have a song man one year straight. It's selling for one year, not a little thing like some tune come and just sell for one month and done. Them tune they sell and never ever die. People still buy them. My biggest sales in this store is um all this. And I have everything up to date in I'm up to date. Rocksteady saw a power shift in the music industry. It was still dominated by the former sound system bosses, but Coxon and Studio One would never be quite the same force again. Many of the artists, like the Paragons, Alton Ellis, and the Melodians, promptly signed up with his old rival Duke Reed, who still ran his own sound system and realized the potential of the more easily danceable Rocksteady beat. When the first song came out, like Alton Ellis sing a song called uh, Girl I've Got Today. Do, 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 do. Do, boom, boom. Do, 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 do. And when Duke Reed put on that song, I was there. He had to play the song about one dozen times. And you can see, this guy was very fast. He had to spin, he had to dance, he had to dance in a fast pace. So what we did was, at the time, most of them had the same bass line, because the bass man didn't have enough time to emphasize on his bass line. So what we did was cut it down a little so the bass man could more move his fingers and have a line. So that's how he comes to have these reggae lines. Do 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 You know, you give him more time to do that. In the sky he couldn't do that. Reed's Trojan sound system had been notorious for the vicious fights that often accompanied his dances. Experiences which made the ex-policeman the ideal man to set up his treasure house studio amongst the rude boys of downtown Kingston. He was a no-nonsense man. He never harbor any foolishness. Police used to go and come. If, if you're a rude boy, you have to leave your rude boy business outside, right? Then you could have seen him. As I say, was a no-nonsense man. And this is his studio over there, on top. What is his studio? You know, his, his engineer was with a man called Smitty. One of the best in Jamaica. Mr. Smitty, his engineer. Now down here was his liquor store. You'd have a lot of boxes on the, on the roads with liquor and drinks and all those, and nobody take anything. Well, you see, Duke, he's respected around the area, and he's well armed. He got at least three guns on him. One long one, one on his hip, and one on his feet. That's Duke, the first gunman in Western Kingston. If Duke even not in the studio, him have a box downstairs in him liquor store. And when everybody upstairs dancing, so boy, this gun, this gun. And out of nowhere, blah, boom, boom, And that, that juke fire shot and the whole shoe, they get quiet. Do you see the big man? He will run up the stairs. He say to Tom McCook and all those people, what are you playing? I don't want that. I want this, I want that. You know, everybody, got to, everybody just shut up and listen to what he said. Then you had a on man, he's dead now, near Marquis. He said, listen, and you, he said, play it back, Smithy, and quiet and Marcus put out him head like this and said, yes, yes, the boss was right. The two need a 17 there, sir. Rocksteady lasted 18 glorious months, but finally there was no escaping Jamaica's worsening conditions. Bass lines became heavier and the subject matter more socially concerned. Give me money. And we go into reggae now. And how we get to reggae now? Reggae is a different changing of the drum. We, we, we have the drum playing more burro like. Oh, I don't know if you understand. Like, tap, ta da, pa da, pa pa da, pa da, pa pa da. And change the, the, the bass pattern. If the music even slow, it make it sound like it fast. So that is the reg what the reggae do to the rock steady. And that was it. Reggae, 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 reggae.
Reggae was everywhere. Dozens of studios sprang up and sheer volumes saturated the market. Producers needed a new outlet for the music. A guy was working with Island at the time named Dave Betridge come out here and meet me and they invite me over to England in 68 and I see what the people love. England is the gateway to real reggae music. The English market became essential to Jamaican producers with its large and by now settled Caribbean community. When I went to London, Bob and Dan myself, that was when I first learned that Feel Like Jumping was also a big song in England. I was, we were just in Jamaica not knowing what was happening. What was happening was that by the late 60s, companies like Trojan Records had spotted the large underground following that had developed for this new reggae pop music. White kids that were hanging out with the black kids from the same areas yeah. grew up on the music, you know, we were all hearing it. And, it was just know, a fashion, in the youth culture of the day. Yeah, you know, well, that was it. Where the we, thing, we, like, fashion, we only had the youth clubs. You know, I mean, yeah. our, nobody was old enough to go to nightclubs anyway. That's it. Trojan Records came to enjoy iconic status as the purveyors of Jamaican music in the UK. They released 2,000 singles in seven years, initially on a fairly small scale, through specialised shops catering to Jamaicans and to white working class youths who revelled in its danceable beat and outlaw status, the skinheads. You get kicked out of Saturday morning pictures when you're too old for it. Uh, you've got nowhere to go for it, for yourself, so Somebody said, oh, this got to Strep and Locarno. And we're talking about the 60s, sort of the skinhead period, really. And so I used to go to Strep and Locarno and listen to music. And we didn't really dance. People did dance, but me and my friends, we used to just sort of hang back and, and just watch, you know, because it was all the skinhead thing, you see. And because they, they never played that music on the radio. So in some ways, for us, it became our music. The Skinners at the time were really into reggae. I mean, they are branding now as what you call a neo-Nazi group that don't like black people and Jews. In my time, I was being protected by the Skinners. Look, I've been to a town that was like Guildford, was a racist town in my time. And this guy said to me, hi, Mr. Black. So I said, hi, Mr. White, and he spit in my face. I said, what the heck? So the kids wanted us to beat him, but I said, no, forget it, man. I just wiped the spit off and that was it. What was happening, it couldn't be denied that this was developing into something that was becoming more and more commercially interesting and commercially successful. As more and more people discovered the music through the clubs. And that was making for all sorts of problems for us because we just couldn't get past, we couldn't get past this door. <laughs> I think there was a perception um, amongst the reggae labels that the BBC dismissed uh, reggae to a certain extent. To be fair, I think possibly, yes, I think they might have a, a slight case there. Bob Marley and the Wailers failed their BBC audition because in the uh, view of the panel, they didn't know how to play reggae. Which was, uh, but then you get some kind of, uh, you know, the BBC Dance Orchestra doing a strict tempo version of reggae. People would say, oh, that's, that's how reggae should be. <laughs> if our music had an open door, like, let's say, a freeway, we could break wide in any part of the world because we are class, we have class music like anybody else. Young, gifted, or black. We just did that song because we were teenagers wearing afros and you know trying to be two conscious black people and we said this is a good cover song for us to do. Trojan were determined to break reggae to the mass market and pulled out all the stops for their new releases. When they introduced strings on the British versions 
of the songs, I think it made quite a difference because they made them more into, not, not so much the raw sound, but would probably be acceptable elsewhere, but it made it more into a pop record and then went to a much bigger market. Reggae became part of pop mainstream. Skinheads, the BBC, school dances, suddenly everyone was playing reggae. Sound the soul! I am the boy, and I'm still here again. Even Ansel Collins went to number one, as did Desmond Decker. Jimmy Cliff, the Scatterlights, Prince Buster and Ken Booth all stormed the charts. And everyone loved it when Max Romeo turned out to be a new kind of rude boy. Because there was the wonderful Max Romeo wet dream thing, which was uh, just such a great pop record. Or that, obviously the lyrics, on, you know, you can see why they had a problem with that lie down gal, let me push it up, push it up. I tried to explain, I said, look man, I'm not, I have nothing to do with sex. I'm talking about my house leaking here. Me and my lady sleeping in bed, rain falling, the, the, leak, the roof is bloody leaking. She's getting up to, 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 to plug the leak and I'm saying, lie down girl, I'll push it up. They didn't buy that. <laughs> The last couple of years of the 60s were a reggae explosion, and by 1969, Desmond Decker was filling Wembley like visiting royalty. That reggae pop music, I suppose, you know, we were beneficiaries of it as well, you know. We, the doors had been opened and people had been softened up enough to, to start listening, you know. The music of downtown Kingston had not only conquered Jamaica, but made it to the heart of the old colonial masters. And there was still a great deal further to go. Oh, we gotta do, we gotta do all things. Everybody got to rock. Part 2 next Sunday at 8 on BBC2 and there's a new reggae website from BBC I. You can find everything from Scat, a UK garage and a guide to the Jamaican fashions and dances at bbc.co.uk slash reggae. And the vibe.